Tonight's dedi- so I won't do a recap. I did a little recap last time, so if you want to watch the recap of the, basically all previous seven weeks, you can go watch last week. Um, it's on YouTube. But what are we going to do? That's the topic of this evening. So and that's why I said I, I, this is probably more, this, this could probably be a whole quarter of a class in and of itself, is what do Christians do? I think we've adequately evaluated and appraised where we're at. Wouldn't you say, do we have any questions like about what the worldview that we're dealing with, what's out there? I mean, we've traced it all the way back to its roots and you know, now we have this sort of postmodern malaise that we're, that we're living in. Um, I'll, I will recommend a book before we really get digging. It's an older book, um, like 30, 40 years, but it's uh, Leslie Newbegin. I mentioned him last time. It's called The Gospel in a Pluralist, this Pluralist Society. This is a classic. I'm sure Mike has this one on his shelf somewhere. Leslie Newbegin. That he was a British Church of Scotland, which I, I believe the Church of Scotland's reformed tradition, Calvinist, and he was a missionary in India for about 40 years, and when he came back to, when he came back to Scotland, came back to Britain, he found that the, the, the ground beneath his feet in terms of Christianity had shifted dramatically, and it had shifted into exactly the things we've been, we've been covering, and how truth has now been subjectivized. Um, he, he says, uh, you know, we, we're at a place where we regard math and physics as fact and anything philosophical or theological as opinion. And that's where, that's where we're at. And so you have a, a difficulty with sharing theological truth or gospel truth with people who just regard it as your, that's your opinion. Or I even heard it tonight in a meeting. Thank you for sharing your truth. And so how do you, how do you relate to that? How do, how do we share the gospel with that? Um, and this is at least Newbegin's modest attempt to do that. It's a wonderful book. I re- I've read it numerous times. Um, and he, well, we'll get into how, what we're going to be doing. So, where to begin? Let me just give a quick little summary of where we're at, uh, especially modern day Christianity. There's a couple points I'd like to I, I taught a class a number of years ago uh, called Why My Neighbors Don't Go to Church. And I think I have 10 points here. If you could see, we'll just kind of go over these quickly. Why my neighbors don't go to church? Is that a question that you've ever, ever wondered? You have neighbors who are generally, you'd say, uh, good people. Uh, they're kind, they're you know, generous, they're good neighbors. And why don't my neighbors go to church? And number one I have up there is, these aren't in uh, order of, for instance, these aren't in order of uh, importance or weight. But number one, I'll give you a great book to read on number one, The Feminization of Christianity. I'm one, before we get into that, I'm one that the church needs balance. It needs the masculine and the feminine. It needs both of them. And I think the church, particularly in the United States, if you think of mainline churches, has become imbalanced. And you'll see, for the most part, if you look at the clergy roles, Mike will tell you this too, the clergy roles are still predominantly male. However, the people that actually run a church are predominantly female. And so you have this uh, little, bit of a, little bit of an imbalance. And there's a great book called Why Men Hate Going to Church. And I could give you statistic after statistic after statistic if you think of the nuclear family that... If the mom alone takes the kids to church, there's like a 22% chance that there's going to be retention. That's, and, and any single parent that has to raise their kid in a single parent atmosphere, they, the, that is such a daunting, difficult task that I think we should all be praying for those. And I mean single parent, where you may still be married and having a spouse live in the home, but you're raising them in the faith by yourself. And that happens a lot more than we think. You could just look around your church next Sunday and see that there's a mom kind of alone with her kids. You know. So that's a daunting task. But if the mom takes the kids to the church, they have like, I think, a 22% chance of returning. If the dad does it by himself, it's like a 49% chance. It's almost double. It's over double. 
And if mom and dad both are together on this, it goes up into 70, 70 plus percent that the faith will be retained. But it does go to show you that, dad, you're really, 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 really important to the faith of the next generation. And unfortunately, when you have churches that have, uh, for lack of a better term, it's not, it's not the lady's fault, it's not the men's fault, it's just we play to our strengths. If you have predominantly one gender that kind of runs things, it starts to look like that gender, if you track with me. You go to a predominantly male church, well, you could look at it in the first century, they were called the Pharisees. <laughs> and everything is rule-driven, and it's hard, and it's fast, and it's critical. You know, that you, get, you get predominantly male, you'll get that which that's not good. You get predominantly female, you'll get more of like inclusivity, caring. I mean, I'm just, these are stereotypes, but they're stereotypes for a reason. Um, you'll get more openness. And unfortunately, bless you, what's began to happen in most American churches is that you have sort of that, take for instance, walk, go walk into most churches today, I'm thinking like mainline churches, and walk into a, an old school like a sanctuary worship space, and typically what's the first thing you see? Well, you'll see flowers. And you'll say, oh, well, that's nice. It's like, yeah, maybe. Huh? Um, doilies, you'll see. I mean, you'll see all sorts, your kids' art on the wall. And not that any of those things are wrong. I'm just saying that when, like, guys that I hang with, they would walk into that and feel as uncomfortable in that, env that environment as they would in the lingerie department at Nordstrom's, right? I'm not supposed to be here. Like, this is not, this is not for me. It's like dudes are, dudes are not welcome. And so, go read the book. It's called Why Men Hate Going to Church. They feel like they're being dragged to Nordstrom's, right? They feel like they're being dragged to the mall to go shopping. And it's just, and what's weird is when you open up your Bible, you'll see that, you'll see that, that good, healthy, not unhealthy, good, balanced masculinity to the Bible. I mean, you look at the life of Jesus, you look at the prophets, you look at the apostles, you'll see that. Unfortunately, people don't see that in the church. That's one of the things that's a problem in our society today and in our church society today, and it's affected doctrine in a dramatic way, in a, in a, in a dramatic way, because churches that tend to go in this direction, now this isn't all ladies and this isn't all men. I'm just saying, from a broad brush perspective, you'll see a lot more leniency on social doctrine in a feminized church. Do you know what I mean by that? You'll see a lot more um, openness, embracing to doctrines that the church has not embraced before, such as uh, issues of sexuality. Uh, you'll see that stuff. You'll see uh, there's a a heresy that you will see often in American seminaries too, which is called universalism, because uh, a loving and good God. What? Go ahead, Athena. What's that? Would you want to define it for everyone? Universalism. So you need a balance here. And so when you want to be inclusive and love people and care for people, um, I'm on the side that says it's not inclusive and it's not loving and it's not caring to, to keep people away from Jesus Christ. That's not loving, that's evil. And that, see, that's how I think. I'm more like Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a categorical thinker. Everything that is of Christ is good and godly. Everything that is not of Christ is not good and is not godly. And so to sort of meld this together, the, the kind of the prevailing philosophy of the culture with the church, you, this is called syncretism. Have you heard that term before? You sort of syncretize what the, what's in the culture with the faith, and it sort of blends into a theological souffle. So the church now becomes in, indeci, indistinguishable from the culture. I was just at a meeting up at Bellarmine, and they had uh, five students, and one of the kids said this to our, our board, he said, you got the climate and the culture of what's going on in our society. And he says, I don't know for me, and this is a 17-year-old kid, he goes, should not the climate and the culture of the church 
look different than the climate and the culture of society? Should it not look different? This is a 17-year-old kid saying this. Right? Why do we look the same? And then we wonder why, why Christianity is rapidly declining in the United States. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think, and I think that if we as women would positively encourage them in their roles, it would be something that would be more. Well, well, it's kind of a in many ways, not in all, but in some, in some ways, it's kind of a hard time and age to be a man in our culture. Um, <laughs> because masculinity is often gets slated with a little adjective that goes right before it, especially in universities, which it's called toxic. And, and your natural proclivities towards whatever, towards adventure, towards take, you know, taking charge or charging ahead, however you want to phrase it, are, are viewed as oppressive and intolerant and and if you identify as a woman um but <laughs> uh, but but you get you get my point it's 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 uh it's it's difficult for men to kind of navigate navigate today i mean uh, and so with Christianity, that's viewed as you could even and and men now have been inculcated. I see this in the in the being a Navy chaplain. Men have been inculcated with, uh, gosh, you're not supposed to show these aggressive masculine traits, but you're also not supposed to show that you're weak at the same time. It's like you're in this weird mealy mouth middle ground where you don't know what to do and you you don't know what to think, and it's no wonder that you're seeing delayed, you're seeing extended adolescence. And, and, you know, colleges are no help with this. I mean, they've just turned into extended daycare for the most part. And, uh, well, you know, they've... Well, it, and, and this is why figures such as like a Jordan Peterson, his message to young men is like, take responsibility, get up, make your bed, don't be a victim, put your shoulders back, step forward and go slay your dragon, right? And this is, this is how the message has been to young boys forever and a day until now. But when you say, don't put your shoulders back, that's evil, don't slay the dragon, you are the dragon, then, yeah, what's left to do but sit in your parents' basement and play video games till you're 30, if not later. And so I think God has a greater vision, obviously, for men and for women than what society is putting strictures around. Unfortunately, this is in the church too, right? And so you get the, the number two, and this may, be, this may be more of a source of all of it, is that you get a there's, a, lack of, there's a lack of missional urgency. I put outreach, but a lack of missional urgency, chiefly maybe due to biblical illiteracy. I had a guy at my last church. He's an old Vietnam vet. And I asked him if he would uh, come help me uh, teach on Sundays, teach the high school kids, the young high school kids, uh, after church on Sundays. And he goes, do you want me to do what? And I said, yeah, come, come help me, and then you could take over. He goes, take over. He goes, I'd rather be back in Vietnam than do that. <laughs> I'd rather be getting shot at than teaching high school kids, right? And I, I, I talked to him a little bit, and what I realized is he wasn't scared of the kids. The guy was a decorated war veteran. He's not scared of kids. He was scared of the Bible. He was scared of the faith. He didn't know it. Or he didn't think he knew enough. I mean, you could get to that level too. But it was a, it's a, it's a, he had a fright of Scripture. I don't know. What if they ask me this? What if they ask me this? What if, what if this pops up? 
I saw a stat recently too that said, th this was on the Catholic Church, that 90% of the kids that end up leaving the Catholic Church do so because they ask questions and they're, they don't get answers. You know, and you get these, like I said, the squishy response of, well, don't ask questions, just believe. You get that, that stuff, which is, which is just deadly. And it's not because people have ill intentions about not answering, it's that they don't know their book, which is, which is good that you're here on Tuesday nights because the whole thing is about getting to know and how to apply, what is, to rightly divide the word of truth and to apply it. There's a biblical illiteracy. Look at these stats. The most widely known Bible verse among adult and teen believers is God helps those who help themselves. Which one I write there, which is not actually in the Bible and actually conflicts with the central message of the Bible, which is the opposite of what the central message of the Bible is. That's the most widely known Bible verse. What do you think of that? God helps those who help th helps themselves. Or maybe more so even today, you hear, well, well, God loves and God is just loving. Less than one out of every ten believers possess a biblical worldview as the basis for his or her decision-making behavior. This is what we're talking about today. Less than one out of every ten believers possess a biblical worldview as the basis for their decision-making. My first time I went to a district conference as a pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America in Northwest Washington Synod. I went, and one of the things that was on the agenda to be voted on by the delegates and the clergy there was whether or not the Bible is our sole norm in matters of faith and life and behavior. They voted on that. And they voted in the affirmative, but they amended it. <laughs> and they amended it to say the Bible is our sole norm in matters of faith and experience. Well, now you just opened up Pandora's box when you start talking about experience, right? Because that could, So now my experience is on an authoritative level with Scripture now. How you feel. Gosh. And so, what do you, that's not a biblical worldview. And so what we're dealing with with Christians, and they'll be sitting next to you on Sundays, is... Not only do they not have a biblical worldview, but most Christians that have a biblical worldview would not be willing to apply it into their lives or into their decision-making. That's one thing to have it up here, and it's another to apply it. So, I mean, it's a sticky, it's, we're, we're in a sticky situation. Look at the second bullet point. When given 13 basic teachings from the Bible, only 1% of adult believers firmly embraced all 13 as being biblical perspectives. Would it be a biblical perspective? Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. Trinity, um, justification by faith alone, scripture, these sort of like what C.S. Lewis would entitle mere Christianity. <laughs> the, the, like the, the Christianity that like if you went to a Catholic, you went to a Methodist, you went to a Lutheran, you went to Eastern Orthodox, and you gave them the principles of mere basic biblical Christianity, everyone, regardless of their denomination, would be able to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that say? Only 1% of adult believers. Well, now you're wondering a little bit, like, look at the cultural malaise we're in, and now look at the witness that the culture is getting. Huh. The witness is terrible. That's us. We're not talking about Nietzsche anymore. We're not talking about Jacques Derrida or Richard Rorty or, or Rene Descartes or Albert Camus. We're talking about us. So the question is, here, 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 what do we do? Maybe the first question should be, what is wrong with us? What has happened to us that we've been bequeathed and handed over the mantle of sharing the faith with the next generation, as C.S. Lewis said, which is only one generation, Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. Just one generation. And this next generation, the millennials and the Gen Z, although there's hopes, there's hope in pockets of believers, but for the most part, it's going to be the most unchristian generation in the history of the United States by a factor of four. We're in big trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm here trying to like ring the bell a little bit to say iceberg right ahead. Well, let's keep going. Because I see fundamentally, I hear, here, let me do two things at once. I see the local Christian church as the last best hope for the world and the country. I do believe that. 
and I see the local church as the last worst thing that is taking people away from Christianity as well. In his study of mainline beliefs of mainline Protestants, including Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, George Barna documented a, reje- documented a rejection of key Christian doctrines. Only 35% of mainline Protestant church members believe Christ was sinless. These are called mainline, like, core teachings, right? The sinlessness of Jesus. 34% believe the Bible is totally accurate. <clears throat> 27 agree that works don't earn heaven, and 20% believe Satan is real. Converse that. 66% don't believe the Bible is totally totally accurate. 73% think that you could earn your salvation by behavior or works. And 80% don't even believe in in an individual personality or intelligence of evil known as Satan. What do you do with that? You go into most mainline churches, Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, you'll hear that exact same thing. You'll hear that, guys, you just don't hear it from the pew, you'll hear it from the pulpit. You'll hear it preached. He goes around, this man goes around to enough churches and hears enough church conferences to know, do you hear this stuff, Doc, for the... The average born-again baptized church-going person has embraced elements of Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, Mormonism, Scientology, Unitarianism, and Christian science without any idea that they have just created their own faith. Doesn't it exactly sound like there is no truth, therefore truth is whatever is true for you, so take a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Don't you see the stuff we've been talking about that's materializing and now it's materializing within Christianity itself? And so what's happened is now The Christian church has lost its prophetic voice. What do I mean by the prophetic voice? I define it as not forecasting the future prophecy because what's interesting, if you want to go study prophets in the Old Testament, you say, oh, they predict the future. You know what they do far more than predict the future? Instead, far more than pointing forward, they always point back. Remember the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Remember the God who took us out of the Red Sea and liberated us and brought us out of slavery? Remember that? Remember they two to one point back more than they point forward. Isn't that interesting? But the church now has lost its prophetic voice. What I mean by the church's prophetic voice is to speak at culture. You see what I'm saying? Instead of culture has now become a part of our DNA and infiltrated it, infiltrated us to the point where we can't speak to culture anymore because we are the culture, the church. So, what do you do? Well, uh, here, uh, without a miraculous intervention and a national worldwide revival, you die. You die. Gets worse. Let me depress you more. Um, Soren Kierkegaard defined one of the, when he looked at the 19th century church in Denmark, if you haven't read Kierkegaard, you've got to read Kierkegaard before you die probably one of the most brilliant philosophers that I've ever read. Danish, he's considered the father of existentialism. Kierkegaard said, um, the Christian church dies uh, in, in at least some sense from lack of passion. What, I mean, yawns. <laughs> no one cares. It's just, it's just kind of, par- hey, pastor, is, is, is the church available this Sunday? Can you get, we, can, our, our, we, wanna, we have a baptism, we'd like to get our kid done. Like it's a set of, you know, inoculations that should, that should be baptized. We're, and then you read the New Testament, and Paul says, when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's the language of baptism in the New Testament, and it's death and life. It's light and dark. It's a big deal. And what do we have now? We have religious ritual. What's going on here? And this is, I would even say, this happens in good churches. You want to see some bad ones? I could give you some websites where you could go on their websites, Lutheran churches, Episcopalian churches, where you would just, and I'm not here to church bash, but, I'm here, but I am here to doctrine bash. And you look at some of the stuff that's on their webpage and you'd be like, 
good night. This looks like Moloch from the Old Testament. This is just Baal. <laughs> and it's, it's right here. Uh, here's a great, great, great fa- Facebook site that I look at called Woke Preachers. And I love to watch it because uh, I laugh lest I weep. <sighs> Number three, there's been a technological revolution. We kind of talked about that. Internet, Facebook, emails, iPhones, Twitter. The church is woefully behind. Number four, the number one con- Number one deco- declining, f- number one phrase you hear in a declining church is we, they consider themselves friendly. Because they are with each other. <laughs> there's, no, there's no great commission posture, right? Great commission posture goes that way. And most Christian churches, you know, in the last 200 years go this way. They close in and the great commission posture is to go out. Mike, uh, your, your buddy, Michael Green, wrote a wonderful book called Evangelism in the Early Church. And he did a, I don't know if that was his doctoral dissertation, I'm not sure, but he did a deep dive on how Christians in the first three centuries shared their faith. And do you know he said primarily? Because you've got to ask yourself a question. How did you go from, you know, a couple dozen people and in 200 years to 34.5 million in the entire Mediterranean world is converted to Christ? <laughs> Let me make this even weirder. The entire world of the empire that killed Jesus in 200 years converts to Jesus. <laughs> That's a weird sentence to even say historically. That happened. Well, how did that happen? Well, Michael Green says, well, number one, the Christians were unbelievably bold, but not just, I'm going to tell them the truth, but they were unbelievably truthful while being winsome and loving and caring and servant-hearted at the same time. People always get scared when you say, we need to tell the truth because they think you're going to be a Pharisee. You know, that's why we need the masculine and that feminine emphasis where you could speak the truth, but you could speak it in a way, look at Jesus, that's so winsome, so loving, but, but in another sense, do you ever, did you ever, when you read the New Testament, do you ever wonder, that Jesus just doesn't tell it straight? <laughs> He, no, no, he tells it straight, right? What is Luther's phrase? The, the, the gospel comforts the afflicted, to be sure, and it afflicts the comfortable, to be sure. Number five, we have an assimilation failure. Um, a lot of churches have open doors, but their back door is even bigger. <laughs> so people, this is what you call Sunday Christianity, which would, be, which would be foreign to the Bible. You're fighting it just by being here right now. I mean, it's a small thing, real small, but it's something. Sunday Christianity, you kind of just show up. You don't serve, you don't study scripture, don't join a prayer group, not share in your faith. The average stat for Lutherans is that an average Lutheran shares his faith with someone or invites someone to worship with him once every 27 years. What do you do with that? Look at this, number five, the bullet point. Most churches will not change. Only 10.2% of churches are willing to change in declining churches. Only 10.2% are saying, okay, we got to do whatever we can without compromising the gospel. So number one, you don't compromise the truth. The truth truth is the truth. Now, how do we share it effectively? Michael Green said, do you know how they would do it? The early Christians, I kind of left you hanging on that one in the laundromat, in the grocery store, or, you know, the marketplace, or the agora, um, on the street, uh, all while being persecuted too. How many, how many people, let's say, in your church that you go to on Sundays, how many people do you think would still be coming if it was illegal, and furthermore, it would maybe even cost you your job, or let's even get more forceful, your life, to be here right now or in your church on Sunday, how many do you think would be left? I, I don't think there'd be many, right? Because if it's just something that we do and also something that kind of makes me feel good on a Sunday and grandma wants us to do it because, you know, she's always calling me about, you need to go to church more, so we're going to go this Sunday because it's Mother's Day. Those people aren't going to stick around under persecution, guys. They're gone. So 
of the church today, how many are willing to say, hey, we'll do whatever we can to bring people the gospel without compromising the gospel? 10.2%. Come on, you know, um, and uh, I thought, they might want to really change. No. And I even say things like earlier, you said that cows need to be uh, uh, ground into hamburgers. I mean, I don't say things like that. It's just a, a building code, just everything's a sacred cow. But it's not really sacred. Well, this is why here I listed six things here that's th- th- these are just off the top of my head, so don't take these as like gospel, of course, duh. But like the church of the New Testament was unbelievably nimble. Jesus chastised the lack of nimbleness in Mark chapter 7 where he says to the Pharisees, you have a fine way of rejecting the word of God to keep your own traditions. And so, right, they would rather hold on to their traditions than hold on to the word of God. Sadly, there's a great documentary about this called God Has Left the Building, about mainline Christianity. You should go watch it. It's about 10 years old. God Has Left the Building, and it's the discussion of the decline of, main, of Christianity, that you have people that still attend. They don't even hardly believe it. They can't espouse doctrine. And remember, we're only about a generation behind Europe. What's going on in Europe today with Christianity and Christian churches? Beautiful cathedrals, and they're all empty. And you know, generally the response of the church, the Christian church has just been, well, let's just keep going. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. No change whatsoever. Um, Yes. Yes, sir. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it was dark. Mm-hmm. I don't view that as a bad thing. No, no, mom and dad too would be like, get out of bed. Yep, that's right. Correct, correct. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and I like to say, a, 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 a same point, but a different angle, you guys. What I like to say is that, well, I, I hear people say, well, I just, you know, we had an auction last night, and we were pretty tired the next morning, or I didn't feel like it, or I have a slight headache, and it's like, none of those things ever kept anyone away from a Seahawks game. <laughs> and, I, guy, and I'm a football junkie, yeah. right? I take football and go, <laughs> Right into my veins, you know, I'm addicted to it. None of that ever kept anyone away from a football game. And so, or, or like, I've heard this so many times at my church. Well, where was everyone today? Well, it was really sunny out. I'm like, oh, okay. And then gets in the winter, I'm like, where is everyone? Well, it was really rainy out. And then, I'm, so I figured out for people to have, have an excuseless weather reason to come to church, it has to be like, partly cloudy with a chance of sun breaks and no rain but not too hot there has to be like this sweet spot i mean what are we doing now his point is valid because how did god charge the gospel to the whole world to begin with yeah it was through an unwed teenage mother <laughs> and, and and broke fishermen and ex-IRS agents. <laughs> that's, that's what he used. He didn't, he didn't take a president. He didn't take a king. He didn't take a congressman. He took broke fishermen, ex-prostitutes, <laughs> and former IRS agents and went bang over the whole, whole Mediterranean world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, oh, and, and, uh, and a murderer, the Apostle Paul. I mean, and so, there, so that's why I say it looks dim, but it's, it's gotten so dim that we have to rely on our best hope. Yep. <laughs> and our best hope is uh, the same, the Jesus who's the same yesterday and today and forever who has promised there will always be a remnant and he will never leave nor forsake. That's, we're actually, you mean we're actually going to have to rely on Christ here going forward? Yes. Yes. Um, let me just, these are just a couple of things. Um, number two, Bible study. One of the most effective methods for people deepening in their faith is still, you know what it is, you guys? I've seen the stats. It's getting into the Word. I like this phrase that I listen to this podcaster. He says, you get into the Word until the Word gets in you. And that's still the truest method, or not method, tool, I mean, to which people... It's like, you know, I, what I talked about last week when the, when the lights turn on with faith? Do, do all of you remember that, that, that time or that period in your life where it's like you knew the doctrine, you knew the verses, you've gone to the classes, you've gone to this, and you're still bored, you're still tired, you're still lethargic, but there comes a time where it's like the lights turned on, right? Um, usually that comes from, the, comes from the Word of God. This is, I love... Martin Luther gave five verbs to describe how the Holy Spirit works when, he turned, when, when God gets a hold of someone. Do you know what they are? They're in the small catechism, Luther's catechism. These are the five verbs he gives to the Holy Spirit. As my teacher Gerhard Ferdi called the Holy Spirit, God the verb. <laughs> God the verb, God on the move. He calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies, and keeps. Calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies, and keeps. And so when the Holy Spirit gets on the move, you have people who are sleepy in their Christianity. They wake up. You know, it's, you know what I'm saying? Go ahead. I work in youth ministry, and you see kids all the time, like, they're smoking cigarettes, they're pulling out their cigarettes. As they come in, they experience, like, what you're saying, the Holy Spirit calls people, fall on their faces and do and come to prayer ministry. Yeah.
I do too. Mm-hmm. Hey, I like that. Like, it's, it's not Things are drying out. To be discouraged by. We shouldn't sit here and be discouraged because a discouraged church is a church that has a passivity. Correct. An encouraged church, a church that looks at the problem and says it's doing, is a church that like, follows Jesus. Well, and that's one of the things I say, Elijah, is the fact that, hey, if, if, like, habitual Christianity or institutional Christianity or the Christianity that says, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we have to attend because it's mom wants us to go. If that's gone, that means that probably the people that are going to be rocking and rolling with you actually believe it then. Because they're not forced to be there. Yeah. So that's one of my methods. Well, let me finish. Have high expectations for people, right? Don't, it's the way I coach football. You don't coach to the lowest common denominator. You coach to the highest common denominator, right? Don't have low expectations. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're, you've been saved at such great cost, now be willing to give a great cost because you've been saved at such great cost. Be, have high expectations for people, yeah. not low expectations. Um, number four, we need an outward focus, but people who are on fire for the gospel don't even need to be told that. That's what's funny. The, 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 you know, Jesus, we always call it the Great Commission, right? How many of you actually looked at that passage in the original Greek? <laughs> we say, what do we traditionally translate it as? Go and make... It's not a, yeah, it's not an imperative verb. It's as you are going. So that it, Jesus just kind of takes for granted that you're going. <laughs> right? It's... it's, it's and so as you are going, and so I have a statement that I like to say is like, God can't steer a parked car. And so it's like, where, where are we going? I don't know. You just push the accelerator and let God steer you, but push, pushing the accelerators first. So don't worry about steering until you push the damn accelerator. Um, expository preaching. That's just another way of saying it. That's starting to resonate with people in a deep Holy Spirit way is that you're in the word. You take a passage of scripture, you squeeze it, you wrangle it. You don't get up there and just tell anecdotes and stories about yourself. And, you know, what's your phrase? You said uh, you have a book. Three, Three points in a poem. And you just kind of talk about yourself. There's nothing wrong with poems. I quoted one last Sunday. But I'm just saying that the text, the biblical text, for your pastors needs to be the driving force of their proclamation, the biblical text. Right. Um, and like Tim Keller says, he just passed away two weeks ago, Tim Keller says, most modern day pastors, the pulpit, having to be in the pulpit, drives them to the word. Well, good night, I gotta preach this Sunday, I better get into the Bible. Where he says, the word should drive you to the pulpit. Not the pulpit to the word. The word, your time in the word, should drive you to proclamation. Just the opposite. And that's what, and so hey, there's some practical things you could do with your pastors at, at, at your church. Get your church board together and say, we want our pastor every day, two plus hours in his study, not in his office, in his study. He's not a CEO. He's a proclaimer, preacher, shepherd in his study, sharpening his axe or his or her axe. Two hours a day. Uh, Jim Nestigan said that's what, when he arrived at his church in Coquille, Oregon, where he, down by where he grew up, that they said, we expect you to be in there studying and working, wrangling with the biblical text and praying, working through the languages from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock every day. That's, and it was, in his, it was like in his pastoral contract. That's a church that's going to be Okay. But if they're like, well, pastor, let's, we need to have a meeting about the curtains and about the rug, and we need to talk about the furnace and what we're going to do about that. Don't, don't, don't expect anything to change in that regard then. Because wow. you've just hired a CEO. You don't need a seminary graduate for that. No. <laughs> you could go down to Mike's Mechanics you know, garage and get that. I'm not saying the pastor shouldn't know these things. I'm just saying 
they probably spend 80% of their time in 20% of the things that make a result. It's true. And we need modern first century worship at the bottom, what I'm saying there. Um, there's beautiful modern worship, you know, worship music that we have. I mean, we sing it at our church. But one of the beauties is I, I always say, don't forget the old ones either, right? Because go look at some of the old hymns of the faith, which, by the way, if people say, well, I like the old hymns, you'll say, well, yeah, but, you know, when Luther wrote A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that was new. <laughs> Luther was the hill song of the 16th century, right? Um, you know, um, and so you don't don't neglect that. And so I think what what our culture needs is that sort of a a blend musically, because some of the beauty of the old songs is that they they're deeply grounded biblically, deeply grounded biblically, and they're deeply grounded doctrinally. And so not only do they help us praise which um, sometimes there's a need for a song where we just praise, and it's repetitive, and we praise for a long time. But many other times, there's, we, we need to praise, and we need to be taught while we praise. So you see a lot of these old hymns, they teach the faith. Like, look at this. Rock of ages. Well, what's that about? Rock of ages. Well, Jesus Christ is the, our sure foundation, the rock. And what's he talking about? It's also a melding of Exodus 33 where God takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of, the rock, cleft of a rock and Jesus is the rock to which we can hide. Just in that rock of ages, cleft for me. In seven words, you just got about a, you know, <laughs> three, four Bible, Bible truths. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Um, your life is hidden with God in Christ, Colossians 3. I mean, you could, you could go on and on and on, and those old hymns always end with what? The promise of eternal life. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyelids close in death, right? Rock of ages, then cleft for me. God's going to take you to himself in Christ. It's gorgeous. So I think there's, there's a blend with, my, we need to go back what was your line about, uh, hey, you got to get into the 21st century, and the response is, well, you need to get back to the first century. That's a great line. And so the church needs to stay modern in terms of a relevancy, in terms of the way we do church. But it also, you got to retain, I like to say, you need to be ancient and relevant at the same time. Ancient and relevant. I, I think that's just a really neat way to look at it. Because there's a lot of churches that are relevant, and they're theologically and, and sh they're theologically very shallow. Yeah. And then there's churches that are ancient, but no one knows what the hell they're talking about, and they're not relevant. It's so, I mean, it does you no good to scream and preach the gospel in an empty theater. <laughs> you know? So there's, there's this ancient, ancient but yet relevant nature to it. There you go, back to John 4. I put that one in for you. There's, there's, there's your typical church experience, probably. Can I give you, we got about 10 minutes left, and then I want to see if there's any comments, because I really appreciate, because remember, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit doesn't, doesn't work through a vessel, it works through, when, when, did, when did the Holy Spirit come on Pentecost? While they were gathered together. So, 
the collective wisdom of God's Spirit working is way more powerful than someone with letters next to his name who tells us about stuff. But I will share with you one thing that uh, four, four values that I think the current church needs, and I shared this with our, our staff at church, and we call it TCCC. TCCC. And I think this, you'll like this. What's the first T that the church needs to have? Truth. Number one, truth. What's the truth? Not subjective truth, not what's true for you. Is Jesus Christ Lord or is he not? Is the gospel true or is it not? And when you have the truth, the second, the, the first C, character. What is character? Well, biblically we could define it as humility. Right? So you could have the truth, but you could be, like I said, you could be dead right. And you could be a jerk about it. To which, in the end, what? No one's going to hear you. Right? Because you're a jerk. <laughs> but let's say if you're just so loving and caring that you never bring anyone the truth, no one's going to hear the truth either. Either way, you could be a jerk with the truth or not give the truth at all. Either way, guess what? No one's going to get the truth. That's a problem. Truth, character, right? So humility as you share the truth. Courage. What did C.S. Lewis say about courage, you guys? Courage isn't just one of the virtues of the gospel. He says it's the virtue that gives a beating pulse to all the other virtues. So it does no good if you're compa- it does it does no one any good if you're compassionate but you don't have courage to be compassionate. It has no good if you have a, oh, I have a commitment to the truth, but you don't have a courage to stand up for it. And this is what you see so often is these two people just roll over. And it's like, oh, well, you know, Aunt Becky's here and we know that she hates the church and hates Christianity. And so our Thanksgiving dinner, we were going to have Elijah pray, but we're not going to now because Aunt Becky will get all her feathers ruffled. And it's like, hey, how about this? Instead of like being a pushover and a rollover, you just say, hey, Aunt Becky, hey, we're a Christian home. You're a guest in our home. We're happy that you're here. We're happy that you could be here and drink my drinks and eat my food. But we're in a Christian home and we give uh, allegiance to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we give thanks to him in every circumstance, which the Bible commands us to do. And so, sorry if this offends you, but this is who we are and this is what we're going to do. Why can't people do that? Why, do, why does the little recalcitrant misfit who demands having everything on her own terms, why doesn't she get told the truth? You know? Why does the spoiled child at the picnic who review, refuses to have fun unless she has fun in her own way, why does she get the last word? Why? Because we don't have courage. What do you wonder why... You, maybe Washington, D.C. looks the way it is. is because you have Christians who are in positions as representatives and senators and in administrations and in cabinets, and they're Christians and they have zero courage. Well, that's why you're seeing it the way it is. I don't want to lose my job. To which what you're just saying is like, yeah, I'll, I'll follow Jesus, I'll trust Jesus, but not if it's going to cost me my job. Oh, so you're saying I'll only be faithful and cur- courageous up to a point. If it costs me anything, then I'm done. Think about what we're saying here. If it, if it, if it brings tension to a relationship, then I'm out. If it, if it means I can't have sex anymore, then I'm out. If it means, you know, I'll have trouble at work, then I'm out. Then you know what that just means? You're out. It's not a salvation deal. But good night, it's about being a true, loving servant of your Father in heaven. And that requires courage. Go read here, great example. When they first started preaching the gospel in the book of Acts, Peter and John got arrested. Do you remember this? They got the tar beat out of them. And then they threatened them. And they said, even with Gamaliel saying to them, don't, hey, the, the, who trained Paul, the Pharisee who trained Paul, the scribe, rabbi, hey, don't beat these guys up too much. I mean, he goes, if this isn't from God, then it'll fizzle out. He goes, but if it is from God and we're resisting them, it may be that we find ourselves resisting God himself. And they said, fine, 
No more teaching in the name of Jesus. That's what they commanded them to do. And so Peter and John, they go back where all the disciples were meeting and the, the women and everyone, and they met. And do you know what they, they prayed? And do you know what they prayed? Ha <laughs> watch this. This would be a good one just for you to just pray on your own, out loud, at your church, whenever. There you go. Go ahead. That's the first one. Look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They didn't pray for safety. They didn't pray that they would keep their jobs or that their lives would be smooth and, 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 and nice. They prayed, give us more boldness. And it's not just two chapters later that one of their own is getting stoned to death for being bold. Yeah, this is Acts chapter 4. And then you get into chapter 5, chapter 6. Now in chapter 7, you have Stephen being, Stephen being stoned to death, having rocks thrown at you till you die. Imagine that type of fate. That's what we're missing. Truth, character, courage. And then the last one. Consistency. <laughs> Famous quote. Consistency is the most underrated word in the dictionary. You have people that are courageous sometimes. You have people that are truthful sometimes. You have people that are faithful and reliable sometimes, but not all the time. They're not reliable. Hey, I'll be there. I'll be there. Oh, I'll be there Sunday. I'll help. But uh, yeah, you know, I can't. I, I, you know, I. We were, you know, the. We're really tired this morning, so we can't make it. Consistency. The, you need these things, but you need to be consistent with it. And I think that's what a lot of churches are missing today. I think... In those three things, especially. Be consistent in the top three. Truth, character, courage. Always be consistent. Yep, you're right. You're so T triple C, those are the values that I think the church needs to... Right? The truth of the gospel... Character, you share it with humility. And remember Lewis's definition of humility? What is it? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. Because your eyes are fixed on Jesus. You're not looking at yourself anymore. That's what old Nestigan, my teacher, used to say. He said, do you know, it's interesting. Um, faith never sees itself. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, thanks, teacher. Um, but faith never sees itself, right? It just sees Jesus. And so, otherwise you get into having faith in faith, and that's a problem. You know, that's when you get into adverbial theology, as we like to, uh, Gerhard Ferdi used to say at seminary, do you really believe? Do you truly believe? Do you actually? And well, when you get into adverb theology, you start to look, well, do I? Do I really? And then you're, you're in the rabbit hole of the self, and you start to have faith in faith, rather than on your object, of faith, who is Christ Jesus. So, and it's like the illustration I gave a couple weeks ago in church. What, how much faith does Jesus need? They ask him this. What does he say? Yeah, the smallest thing that they could conceive of. <laughs> so he said, do you need this perfect, robust faith? And people said, well, if your faith was better, then your prayer would have been granted. I, I would say, well, Jesus prayed in the garden that the cup would pass, and that prayer wasn't granted. So did Jesus not have enough faith? Oof. That's bad doctrine, right? And so if there's a bridge going to the other side here, I'm on one side of the cliff, there's the other side of the cliff. First guy comes, he goes, I'm fully certain that this bridge is going to hold me up. And off he runs across, and he's safe. Second guy goes, oh crap, I don't know, it's, it's kind of maybe, it's 50-50. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I'm 50-50, I think it will, but I don't... I just don't know, and he runs across, and what happens? He's safe. Yeah. Third guy goes, I don't think that bridge looks, it's rickety, it's crappy, it's, I'm never going to make it, a, you know, Gulliver's Travels, we'll never make it. We're never going to make it across. And he runs across, and he's safe. What's the point? Faith. 
it's not the quality of the faith that saves you, it's the quality of the object of your faith that saves you. That's what it is. Would you rather have strong faith in a weak object or would, would you rather have really, really weak faith in a really strong object? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what you got. It, the object of our faith is what's important. That's Christ Jesus. Right. Would you, do you want strong faith in a weak object or weak faith in a strong object? Yeah. And that's what Jesus is saying. Just trust me. Quit looking at yourself. Best, oh, here's another illustration. You've heard this one and then we'll get going. <sighs> There's a good definition of faith. Gracia Grindle, one of my professors at seminary, told me this one. You've heard this before. There was a guy who was pushing a wheelbarrow across Niagara, Niagara Falls on a high wire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard this one? Yeah. And the crowd assembles, and he's walking the high wire, and they're, and they're like marveling. And he gets back, and he says, do you think I could do it again? And they're like, oh, yeah, we believe you. You could do it again. You could do it again. And there was one guy right in the front. He's like, we believe in you. We believe in you. And he says, oh, you do? Yeah, you sure? Yes, we think you could do it. And he goes, get in the wheelbarrow. Now, see, that's, but that's what faith is. That's what he's talking about. Faith is the hope and the conviction of things that you can't see, right? And so that's, I think these things are what our church needs to imbibe. And Anything for the good of the order, guys? Any questions or comments? Yes, Sue? Would you tell us again uh, how much Christianity was in Greece or Greece or Greece as a culture and Greece as a this, this, this is in Rodney Stark's book. If you want to read the book, he was, a, he was a professor of sociology at the University of Washington, and he wrote a book while at UW uh, called The Rise of Christianity. And he was not a Christian when he wrote it, but he wanted to study he, he, how the greatest movement of all time, numbers-wise, what happened. It's the greatest movement of all time. And it went from, you know, a couple hundred. I mean, if you want to count the first Pentecost, you could throw in a couple thousand, I guess. But in essence, you know, we went from a couple hundred to 34 million in 200 years. Now, how did that, I mean, that is, that, we've never seen anything like that before. All while being persecuted. Now, see, you could study the rise of Islam and not have any doubt how Islam spread. You want to convert, Leonard? I think I do. Good. Next, Russ, do you want to convert? No. Bang, you're dead. Marv? You know, it, it's easy to convert that way with a sword at your neck. And that's historically what happened with Islam. Christianity grew at an exponential rate way faster than that with the sword at its neck. How, that, that, that. It's mind-boggling how that happened. It just might be that it had to be a miracle wrought by God himself. It has to be. I mean, it's, in, it's insane. Guys, with, even before the New Testament was being finished, the, the writing of the New Testament was finished, did you know there were Christians within the household of the emperor of Caesar himself. Right? Go read the end of the book of Philippians. Greet those believers who are in Caesar's household. So, we need a rejuvenation. Now, it's different than the book of Acts because we're in a post-Christian culture, but we need this, we need a, nothing's going to be done. The way I look at it is, I don't know what the solution is, but I do know what we need. Nothing can be done without the truth of the gospel. So nothing. Nothing can be done unless we have a, a humility that is brought about by the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at what God has done for you. Look how low he had to stoop for you. You really think you're really hot stuff? Look at what had to be done for you. You know, courage. Look at what he's done for me. I, you know, when, when the devil approaches and he cowers in front of me, he's not cowering in front of you. He's cowering in front of the 900-pound person behind you that he sees. Because he sees the conquering king of the universe right behind you. And so what do you got to worry about? What, Jesus even said, I know you guys are scared to speak publicly and to testify publicly. When you're before emperors, when you're before judges, when you're before magistrates, don't even worry about what you're going to say. I'll even put the words in you for that. <laughs> Courage. I think this one even more than anything. And then, guys, consistency, 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 consistency. Who was it? Uh, Billy Martin, the old manager, uh, the old manager of the New York Yankees. You know what he said? 
It's not hard for a baseball team to be good every once in a while. It's hard for a baseball team to be good every day. That's hard. It's not hard to see a Christian every once in a while be humble, proclaim the truth, maybe show a little bit of courage. What is rare is to see them do it every day and to be consistent. And we'll end with a quote from Nietzsche, the atheist. (laughs) He defines success, well, success is the wrong word, but uh, purpose or meaning or significance or success, he says, as a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. I like that. He was prophetic. That's exactly what the Christian church needs right now, to be obedient to him. Don't forget your king, you guys, and the power that we have through the, power, through the, the death and resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit of our king. And so in the end, what do we pray for? Like Handel's Messiah, right, Doc? We pray for the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever. That's ultimately when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying that the kingdom of this world will end up, well, it will in the end, become the kingdom of our God. And that's where you guys go on the front line. I would say, let me conclude with this. I've said that three times now. But let me conclude with this. Um, my, my respect for proclaimers of the gospel is not for pastors and preachers. For the most part, they get to talk to Christians every week. My respect is for the mechanic for the mailman, for the, the, the guy who, the garbage man, the doctor, the attorney, who goes into non-Christian environments and shares the gospel with people. They have it hard. Preachers have it easy. Well, I assume there's women in garbage collecting too. <laughs> what about them? In, in the Bible? Oh, ah, toxic masculinity, eh? <laughs> Do you know who primarily, we'll conclude with this, you know who primarily does not want tox, to, uh, who primarily has the biggest problem with talk, you know, the phrase toxic masculinity? Normal women do. <laughs> it, what kind of partner do you want? I mean, do you want an incompetent, overgrown child? <laughs> no, you want a man. <laughs> Right? You want a guy where there's weird stuff in the basement and you say, you want him kicking you in the back in the middle of the night in the bed and say, go find out what that is, Kim. <laughs> no, no, I have a meme. I, sh- I should share you. That I have a, a, a meme on my phone that I've saved and it shows the June 6, 1944 and it shows the amphibious boat on the beach opening up and it shows these guys running onto the shore in in Omaha Beach on D-Day and it says, June 6, 1944, the day toxic masculinity saved the world. (laughs) We like it when the enemy's at the gate. (laughs) And that's that's the thing, when you have an existential threat like that, all that that other crap just goes by the wayside. It does. First witnesses, Athena. There's a woman apostle listed in the book of Romans. Junia, Junia. You know, those gals were unbelievable in their courage and in their bravery, in their humility, because not only were they proclaiming the gospel in that culture, they were proclaiming the gospel in a culture that devalued them. At least the men had somewhat a voice. They didn't, and they still were bold. I just go back, you need a good balance. You, just, you need a healthy balance. That's what you need. All right. Go change the world for Jesus. Huh? Thank you, Father, for your word. Keep us steadfast as, the, as, as, your, as, as Martin Luther wrote, Lord, keep, Lord, prayed, keep us steadfast in your word. Your word is truth. You said that, Jesus. Those who continue in my word are truly my disciples. You said, for those who continue in your word. 
and they shall know the truth and the truth shall set them free. We pray for our children and our grandkids right now, Lord. Next generation, re-Pentecost us, Lord. Send fire from heaven, Lord, and do it again, Father. And we pray that you would, your kingdom come would be done among us. We, woo, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I just got a little Holy Spirit chill there.